gentleman, Paul Lukovic. Yeah. Thank you very much for the um, invitation, the ability to speak here. So what I'm going to talk about is really something that relates to two large projects. One is the Humane AI Net, and the other one is sort of a local project, Sustainable Embedded AI. And I would like to start by sort of giving you a background on it. So the Humane AI Net project is one of these huge EU networks with 50 partners, which the EU uses to sort of structure the AI um, community. But actually, as a community, it goes back much further than that. It started with, with the early um, uh, FAT flagship um, call Future ICT, and then we had actually the Humane AI Net as a, another flagship where the flagship program was canceled. It sort of deals with combining AI, HCI, social science, uh, let's say something like AI for good, hum human-centric AI. Uh, the other project, the sustainable AI, is sort of a local version of it. I don't want to spend too much of it focused on, on sustainability, both in terms of applications and in terms of how the AI works. And let me start by showing you what you sometimes, sometimes call sort of the, the propaganda movie of the Humane AI Network, which is sort of a public-facing uh, summary of, of the project goals as a motivation to, to more of the scientific part of what I will be talking about. So let's see if it starts. A technology revolution has led us to a crossroads. With Humane AINet, we will guide Europe towards a better future in this new era. For humanity, with AI, from Europe. The potential of artificial intelligence is massive. Imagine businesses and factories prospering and being profitable while providing their employees good working hours, health care, equality and the best benefits of a working life. Humane AINet is about technology that will help Europe achieve this vision and sustain it in a competitive globalized world for people, for the planet, and for prosperity. What we really need to do is think about AI as a way of empowering human beings, making human beings better. A brighter future requires science. In Humane AI Net, we are working on science and innovations for humans. We will work to create AI that respects human autonomy, AI that is fair, transparent, and within the rule of law. AI that increases our abilities as workers, our insight as decision makers, our enjoyment as customers, and our well-being as individuals. AI that helps strengthen our democracy and assure a better society for all. From Turkey to Ireland, from Portugal to the Scandinavian North, within Humane AI Net, researchers, innovators and practitioners join forces to leverage the AI revolution to strengthen the European economy and society and to empower all people across Europe. With the concept of micro-projects, we combine the benefits of a pan-European network with the research in small agile groups to provide tangible results that will drive European research and innovation. With the AI revolution in full swing, key industrial players are already engaged in Humane AI Net to build an innovation ecosystem where all companies, from small to big, can grow. What would be my dream is to really change the future to something we all want to live in. Okay, so this is like, again, a, a public facing, like, like sort of a propaganda video, but, but it's really important to, you know, communicate why you do the research to the public. And, and we probably all agree sort of on the, on the high level goals that, that you may have there. But the problem is, that when you go below high level, I it's not that clear, right? Even the definition of, of what is beneficial and good and ethical is something that you like to be very different across different stakeholders, right? So, so, so the employers would like to reduce costs, the, the, the workers would like to uh, get better work, and if you go to cross-culture and things, so really, what do you define, and, and, and you know, how do you want to hard-code this, this beneficial thing into your technology? 
And even if you decide and agree on those things, of course, translating this sort of very high-level, good-sounding social goals in, into scientific challenges I is a non-trivial thing, right? So, so one, let's say, approximation and thing that we look in the project is saying, okay, uh, well, people know what's good for them, right? So essentially, if you can build system, then rather than imposing something of people or doing something in their place, just help people do, achieve, and accomplish what they would like to accomplish in a better way, seems like a good step in this direction. Again, you may agree that it doesn't solve the problem of good AI, right? Because you may use it for, for, for evil purposes, and we'll not argue what for. But then it's up to the people. And also another thing that is quite relevant is when you talk about e ethical and, and legal AI, the question may not be as much about embedding certain ethics and legal norms into the system itself, but allowing the system to operationalize whatever the respective uh, political and, and social bodies decide to be good, which is actually related to this notion of empowering people because it empowers people to, on their level, specify what they would like the system to do. And that's what I really wanted to talk about. So this is this notion of this, this cognitive exoskeleton. And, and what it actually means is, I really like to start with a citation from, from Pablo Picasso, who is not a very te technology affine person, but a very good comment. Computers are useless. All they provide are answers. Well, sometimes you do uh, need answers, so it's slightly exaggerating. But he does have a point, and let me try to elaborate on, wh on, on why. And that relates to some of the work we've done on the project on, on our research agenda and defining the problems. That, that particular thing was driven by, by my colleague Jim Crawley, but of course done by, by a lot of people in the team. And trying to understand what are the levels at which a computer can support a human. What sort of different levels of collaboration that we would like to have. And so the first level are, let's say, the primitive system. Sort of reactive collaboration, something, you know, have an action, you have a reaction. It's like pressing a mouse. And the interesting thing is that actually 90% of very, very complex AI system in terms of interaction do exactly this, right? You can have a hugely complex AI system that answers complex questions, plays Go or whatever, but it's still a reactive system. Input, output, that's all. It doesn't really collaborate with you. It provides you answers. Um, the second level is what you call situational collaboration. It is this classical you become thing. We had some of something when it came to these power systems, right? Where you go into the room and the lightning and the heating is adjusted for you based on what you do and, and what is your current situation. It's a classical context aware intelligent systems. The third one is going a step further, what you call operational collaboration, where you don't do not just only want the system to react to your current situation but you really want you to help you achieve your long-term goals. I guess when we have some about the power system in the previous talk it's along this line, you enlist your system to regulate all, sys all of, your, of your energy consumption in such a way that you together satisfy the goal of having an environment friendly and still comfortable life. And, and that really means about expressing goals and sub-goals. It really means about dedicating authority to your system of doing something in, in, in a fairly long term. So, so it's a step beyond just situational collaboration. A step that goes even beyond that is what you call practical collaboration, which really extends to knowledge. So it's not just about having your system regulate your life so that you satisfy the goal of being environmentally friendly and still comfortable, it's about you and your system learning from each other what it actually takes to achieve those goals. And then further along the line is sort of the ultimate way, what you call a creative collaboration, right? It's something that go to jointly creating, solving a problem or creating an artifact. And it's something that most of us know. If you have a human person with whom you work a lot, it's not that you delegate tasks to the person, right? You work on a problem, and then your partner, you know, you say something, and, and people would say something, and that would trigger who you think, and they know what you think, right? So essentially, you play the ball there back and forth, stimulating your thought process, stimulate questioning what you do, trying to raise questions in your mind. It's something that's sometimes called the creative resonance between people. It's sort of the ultimate way of collaborating between humans. And, and if you know that, these is where, where really the sum of the two tends to be more than, than you know, two individual people. So that is what, you know, in, in the end, you would really see if, if we can get AI to allow this sort of collaboration 
that would really be something that can enhance our, our capabilities. Now, a question that often arises in this context is that people say, why do you want that? You, know, you have an AI that is so clever that it can do that. Why not just let the AI solve all the problems and just let the humans do whatever? Well, the standard answer that you put to this is that, well, there's a lot of things AI cannot do, right? So it's the standard thing where people will say you would like to have AI and humans each use their own strength. And typically for humans, the strength is being set at creativity, intuition, whereas sort of computers are said to be good in this data analysis, speed and accuracy. So let me be a bit provocative and say, well, yes, if you look at the short term term, it is something that is intermediate solution. But if you look at the long long term long term vision, then actually that's not the real reason. And that goes back to, to something I remember when we were writing the proposal for the Humane AI net at, at the end of, of the day, we sat down and we we're thinking, okay, so can we write something? What is it that ultimately only humans can do and AI will never be able to do? It was late, we had some beers, so we started thinking. And the answer was, chill out and have a good time. Right? And, and actually, it's not as stupid as it means, because Again, being a bit provocative, this whole notion of creativity is something that comes to your mind as something that computers cannot do very quickly. But creativity is a research field in psychology. If you think about it, it's nothing magical. And it's actually quite controversial, right? You know, today you have computers. I just on my way here, I read an article about computer winning some sort of an art com uh, co um, uh, competition in the US with something it created and seriously pissing off a lot of artists because when, when they actually realized that, that who beat them was a computer. And I remember having a talk with a psychology professor some time ago when I wanted to you know, tease her about computers, what they can do, and creativity, and said, you know, creativity is nonsense. Creativity essentially means, if somebody is creative, what it means is that that person has an intellectual, analytical ability that is so far above yours that what he or she does seems like creative, ad hoc to you. That goes back to, to you know, one of my favorite citations from my from, from science fiction writer, Arthur C. Clarke, you may know that, who once said, any technology that is advanced, advanced enough is indistinguishable from magic. Which sort of you can say, if somebody is clever enough, he's indis dis dis indistinguishable from being creative. So I don't think that is actually a real reason. So what is the reason you know, for having computers actually do something for you and, and, and work with you? And you know, the real reason why you would like to have human-computer collaboration is that for some things, actually having computer do it is not the optimal solution. It's this thing about having a good time. Now imagine that you are planning a family holiday, right? And you go to a computer, yeah, maybe it could recommend to you the optimal location, but the point is, if you've ever done that, if you go and plan a family holiday, the process of searching and planning and thinking and anticipating is actually part of the fun, part of the experience, which means that if the computer just took it away from you, it would not be supporting you. What you want to do is you want it to support you to find a solution jointly and have this fun that does not have you end up in some sort of expensive shithole, but somewhere where you want to be but you would like it not to select the location for you, but to support you select the actual location, even if it could. The same thing is in science. Some of you may know this Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the 40 tooth problem, right? When an advanced race asks the computer to give you the answer to the question of all questions, and after, after centuries came back with 42, right? In science, you really want to understand. You don't want the system to answer your questions. You want to give you understanding. And there are, of course, other areas. You know, if you look at things like, uh, like uh, you know, justice and medicine, sometimes you want humans to make decisions for valid human reasons. And you don't want humans to just rubber stamp something that the system gives them. You actually want to have computers enable people to make better decisions. And, and that is something where actually this collaboration really makes sense beyond the question whether there are things that computer can do that it cannot do that human could do. And you know, if you come back to art, as I said, you know, there's, there's the works of art, right, which are indistinguishable from what humans do and rated better. 
Does it mean that a computer is a better an artist? Well, the answer is, in my answer is no. Because when I admire a work of art, it's not the signal level output that I admire, which is, which is the pixels. What you admire is the ability of the, of, of the artist to translate their experience, their suffering, their happiness, their feelings into that signal level output. So per definition, although the computer probably can generate a similar signal level output, it's just not the same art. But of course, it makes a lot of sense for the computer to help the human being translate their feelings into the signal level output better. Again, the argument for, for supporting people in this sort of a creative collaboration. So the question is, you know, we are, that is the way we see enhancing human capability, but where are we today? Can we do that? And the answer to that is sort of looking back at, at something that I started working on like 20 years ago, the classical Ubicom system. Can I teach my phone when to ring and when not to ring? And the interesting thing is, is a 20-year-old problem, probably 30-year-old, that has not been solved. Because I, I've written papers on detecting that I'm in the talk now, but it's not an issue, right? It still doesn't work. Because the question whether the phone should work, work is not just the location, it's not just the who. It's the context, right? If I had a fight with my wife yesterday morning, then maybe even here I would like to react to the call. It depends on who I'm with, what is the situation. It's all this entire, what you call common ground, the background that the system just doesn't have. It's not just detecting the thing on a signal level. And you know, here's another example. Imagine this thing, a couple are having, you know, having dinner here, and then the, 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 uh, the, the waiter comes and says, you know, who has the salad? And you know, then the lady says, you know, I'm the bunny. And, and what you see is that immediately you know that she's not saying she's a rabbit. She says she will eat the salad. But there's much, much, much more into it, right? Starting with the fact that some of you may actually be thinking that it's not a politically correct example to use now nowadays, which would not have been the case 20 years ago, and which might either be totally unacceptable or maybe, again, totally acceptable in 10 years. And there's much, much more about them. They are probably not on a business dinner. There may be a couple and so on. And it's all of the things that a system that is able to actually recognize the word cannot understand. And really, this is about you know, this huge web of connections that people have in the background that today AI just doesn't have. So what can we do about it? And, and you know, there's also the question of embodiment, where people often say that, uh, you know, I remember a guy from robotics talking about at a conference who said, you know, the only AI is robots because they can actually experience physical reality. Uh, there is something to it, although I'm not a robotics person. Um, so one of the reasons we are now working on this, and I would like to, to do in a, the rest of my talk is really, that what you see now is something I would call like the perfect storm, where actually we may now be in the position to enable system to acquire this sort of sophisticated common ground. And there are three components to that that I would like to highlight. The first one, like everybody knows, is availability of huge amounts of data. The second one is that recently, the last couple of years, you've seen some new techniques emerge in AI that go beyond just deep learning, you know, natural language models, contrastive learning, self-supervised learning, that actually allow us to make use of those techniques. And the third one is, is ubiquitous interaction. And I really believe that it's not, it's just three things. It's big data, this new AI techniques, and sorry, I pressed the wrong button. And, and, and the interactive systems that, that really make the difference. And let me, let me uh, sort of elaborate on that. I don't know why I'm pressing the wrong button. We all know, you know this, this age of big data. There's an infinite amount of data now. But it's more than just amount of data. And, and uh, some of you may know this example. Some time ago, there was this, this press uh, uh, thing that some of the fitness tracker that have a function that will allow you to visualize tracks when people have been jogging. Okay, totally privacy aware, when people are jogging, they create these heat maps, and, and these heat maps essentially show you where a lot of people before you went jogging, which is actually quite good because it allows you to pick nice places. But that those traces have been revealing the location of secret US bases in places like Afghanistan or Syria. Why is it so? If you go into Syria, uh, and, and you know you see this sort of track created with expensive fitness tracker, then it's not likely to be the ISIS uh, public fitness program. It's most likely to be something else, right? 
And the point that I'm trying to make it is that after the internet allows every piece of sort of archival knowledge to be instantly available, we now live in an age where it's not just a lot of data. Essentially everything, virtually everything that happens in the physical world leaves a digital imprint. And while people with privacy protection are trying to do something against this, what you can do is make sure that these things do not have a negative impact, but you cannot prevent it. That is the way the world is currently developing. And why it's relevant is that if you actually leverage this data, you are suddenly building AI systems that can sort of learn from the data that is based on the experience of not a single human who is training the system, but sort of humanity as a whole. Which, by the way, is the reason why Google's, Amazon, and other people are collecting your data, not just to sell you products, because they're training their AI systems. Now, there is a caveat to that, because if you look at just this data, actually it's not that easy to extract something complex and relevant from, from this data. A lot of it doesn't have labels. A lot of the classical learning systems were actually designed for narrow applications. And let me give you a good example of what I mean by the narrow applications. This is sort of a standard example for problems of non-explainable deep learning. And there are many similar examples. Right? So a system that is trained to recognize huskies from dogs. Non-trivial, I cannot do that. The system was really good, but sometime people found it failing. Sorry, I, I forgot to put in the citation here. Now, when they look why it failed, they realized that in the training set, all of the pictures of the wolf were with the snow in the background. So the system just learned to recognize the snow. Now, if you ask the human to distinguish huskings and wolves, they would never do that because they understand what a husky, what a dog, what you want to have background. The system had a narrow task of distinguishing two data sets. That's what I mean by the narrow task. And that essentially is where the second thing, you know, when you look at these new language models, that is where sort of seems to be changing that. I don't know how many of you know the language model things. I just started looking into it like uh, two years ago, coming from the Ubicom sensor area. And what I essentially do is that a lot of the success of this language processing system comes from the notion of mapping words, sentences, even text, simply to vectors in highly dimensional space. And to do this mapping, the way it's being trained is that they just look at this billions of gigabytes of text available online and do the very simple thing. They take sentences, they mask words away, and train the system to guess what work was deleted or to predict the next sentence, which means it's fully unsupervised. Actually, it's self-supervised. You don't need labeled data. And you know, the amazing thing is what these systems can achieve. They actually map concepts that for us human are similar. You know, you can look at the vectors, queen, woman, girl, boy, which are similar. Some of you, you may have heard about this Google engineer who was talking to a Google system and thought that the system was conscious. In my point of view, total bullshit. But at least it looked this way, right? It's about this thing not distinguishable from magic if, it, if, if it's complex enough. And I think that you know, it's absolutely fascinating, and, and people don't think about it. It, it still s you know, stuns me when I think about it. You encode the world, the complexity of the world, just into vectors in 500-dimensional space, and it provides so much functionality. Now, of course, there's a caveat to it, because you are not encoding the world onto it. What you are encoding is text, which is symbols, which is not connected to world, which is actually a weakness of it. But now comes a further development that you are seeing, is that that methodology is being adapted for other things. So you are seeing a lot of other machine learning things, vision sensors, that you have this learning pipeline where you actually encode your, your data first into what's called the feature space, but actually that is this sort of a multidimensional embedding using pretext tasks, things like reconstructions from transformation, deleting words, deleting data, predictions, and what you get here, again, people call it feature because that's what you are used to. In a way, that's what early networks were producing. But actually, if you train it like this, it's this embedded latent space that is not just a feature set for a specific task, like you know, recognizing wolves, but is a very good representation. Uh, you couldn't say understanding of this data, of the problem domain. 
which you can then use, and with very little additional training, use for things like classification, segmentation, regression. But you can also take and manipulate and add stuff to it. So let me give you two examples what we are doing with that. So the first thing is that we are look at, I, I work mostly in using sensors for situation and activity recognition, right? So we would look, for example, at sensor systems where you do exactly this type of training, you know, feature extractor, essential latent space. And then you manipulate the latent space to make the system adjust that space, for example, to ignore differences between users. Big problem, a lot of sensor-based stuff. And what it means is I have this latent representation. It represents my knowledge about the world, not just features for a specific problem. And I can tweak it. Here is another thing that goes into this direction. What we try to do is very often when you train a system in a constrained environment, you have a lot of sensors you can use, a lot of stuff you can use, video, sensor on your body. You deploy it, well, I can have a sensor in a watch and a smartphone, but not all over my body. So can I somehow use the ability to train with many sensors, that's what's called sort of the source here, to then be able to do better recognition if I only have less sensors available? Right? That goes against everything that I learned when I started doing machine learning, but they told me when you train your system, make sure that you train it on the same environment as at the one that you are going to deploy it at. Now, why does it work? Essentially, how it works is that you don't train it on the environment for the task, but you try to use the source data to structure this latent representation that you generate with the system that you deploy later on to reflect what it knows about the problem, right? So the point is, although later on you will not have the source data as the input, but you use what the source sensor knows about the world to impose a certain structure on your, on your system. And this way you can leverage this knowledge. And there's a lot of work that's being done on this direction to be faster. Uh, you know, recently the clip system was training a joint representation for text and, and, and images using just captions, not labels, just random caption, me on the holiday. And then what can be used to do what's called a zero shot prediction, where you provide new classes using text and the system provides you recognition without ever having seen the, seen the image. You can extend that to things like adding audio and other sensors that were done by a colleague of mine of the FKI. Um, and you can even extend it to generation and, and to simulations, which is something that we have also been, uh, been doing in our group for, uh, for animation. I'll just skip that to, to save time. So in summary, what you now see looking at the availability of the data and looking at this new techniques is that you can use this concept of generating latent spaces, of training those latent spaces using things like contrastive learning, self-supervised learning, pretest tasks, to generate not just this natural language processing where the whole thing comes from, but integrated knowledge from language that you have online, from videos and audios that you have online, from sensors. Right? So essentially, by using these techniques, you now are in the position where this availability of everything that humans do online can actually be used to create an AI that possesses the knowledge. Because you are not anymore training the whole thing for a narrow task but you're leveraging different sources of information, some of them actually connected to the physical world, like sensors, um, like images, to create an abstract representation on which you can, which you can leverage to actually do things. You see a lot of work in this direction, the system doing amazing things. And I think that that really is a, a, you know, a new dimension when it comes to trying to generate this type of systems. One last question that is, it's still not embodied because em em embodiment uh, requires that you are actually able to react and influence the world, right? It's this, 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 this loop that you have. You have a theory, you do it, you try something. And that is actually when the last part, you know, this, this interactive system coming. We have watches, we have Alexas, we have smart displays. We interact with the world all the time. That is what allows the system to continuously support us, but actually by supporting us and getting the feedback, the systems interact with themselves. So what you actually now have, and I think this is a really, really significant insight, that if you combine this AI, big data, and, uh, no, what was that? And, interactive and interactive systems, what you are getting is this feedback loop. When AI influences people who generate data, 
which helps train the AI, which generates new data, and this way you have this continuously evolving thing, which actually is very, very tricky, right? Because you ne this is the classical positive feedback loop, dyna uh, dynamic nonlinear system, you never know what these things will actually do. But, but the actual is fascinating, and that is what in the end is driven by these new AI techniques that I was talking about, and then in the end enables us to really build these complex cognitive exoskeletons and maybe creative collaboration between humans and AI by solving this common ground problem, which is relevant for many things. We're not there, but I really think for the first time in AI, we really have these individual building blocks I was trying to outline to actually solve the problem and do that. There are questions whether we really want to, how much autonomy we want to design to the systems. You know, again, these loops can be very unpredictable. But I think that this is something that is very, very profound development once you think about it. All of this coming from this, uh, conf uh, you know, this, this confluence, essentially, of, of um, natural language processing models, big data, new AI techniques. And to finish, I really want to come back to this you know, citation by, um, uh, by Pablo Picasso. Yes, I agree. One of the problems with, with the usefulness of computers is that all they are giving the answers. But that is precisely what we are trying to change using this system. We want to be the AI system that will not just give you answers, that will help you ask the right questions, that you help you find your own answers, and help you understand those answers, enabled by the techniques that I've been trying to outline. Thank you very much. <laughs>